So I'm going to pick up toward the end of this lecture. Uh, as you remember, I will actually jump right here. Um, <clears throat> so we were talking about dynamic analysis, and we were talking about the sequence of steps that an attack may take uh, when it's run inside of an, an your environment. Uh, so. I gave um, kind of this list of eight steps, um, which was eight steps that a, in this case, a bad PDF uh, would have um, performed or could have performed in a system. Uh, this one actually ends up being the file system impact. So we went through a bunch of these um, examples. Um, and I believe that we got down to about uh, here, so I'll jump back up to the persistence mechanisms. Um, so I was working off the, or I was explaining the persistence mechanisms, I think, towards the end of the last class. And the idea here, I gave an example of um, how somebody can modify a service that exists and basically hijack a service, or you can hijack common runtime libraries and things like that and do like a library override attack. Um, so there's basically a lot of different ways but I will, uh, that an attacker can use to get kind of persistence or establish themselves on a system so that their attack resumes after a reboot or after, say, the system is moved to a new location. <clears throat> so I give a list of them up here. And um, uh, I would also say that replication methods, uh, and that is, um, say, mal I didn't go into this last lecture about replication methods like uh, malware copying itself. Um, a great example of this might be um, if malware watches, so if a backdoor watches for you to plug a removable drive into a system, uh, there is code out there and it's a very common technique for it to copy itself uh, onto the removable media, uh, perhaps overwriting another program that exists on the removable media. Uh, real common I'll say that a real common use case in maybe um, an industrial environment for like USB drives is very often to have um, uh, evaluation or testing or inventorying software on the drive. So basically you have somebody who walks around like seven different computers at a, uh, a factory or something like that, um, plugs it into each one of them, double clicks the <coughs> EXE that happens to be on the removable drive so that they can run a program that will perform a test, you know, a battery of tests and then write the results back to the drive and then move on to the next one and so on and so forth. So that's where uh, replication can be almost seen as like an attempt, uh, attempt at a kind of site-wide or non-network um, uh, persistence mechanism. Uh, so I always like to try and include it in this to try and think through those attacks that happen to go beyond just uh, your standard like single target, single system uh, backdoor uh, attacks. So I gave uh, the persistence impact for the particular attack that I had written back at the beginning of the slides. Um, and the big persistence mechanism here is the very is the most simple one that has been around since uh, the early days of Windows 2 or Windows 3 or something like that, which is that there's a startup folder in the start menu, and bad.exe will start uh, the next time the user logs in. Uh, so um, basically, even if the user or maybe an administrator of the system happens to identify that there's a program running that's bad, um, and then they kill it, uh, this gives it a chance to, uh, to run on the, the next boot. <clears throat> so getting into the network traffic uh, discussion, um, to maintain like remote access or transmit data back to the adversary. So a lot of times the purpose of all these attacks are that somebody is uh, not local, somebody's remote to the targets, the people they're targeting by the internet. Um, they're attempting to gain, act, gain unauthorized access and provide them with the ability to either control or at least monitor whatever's going on in that system. Uh, basically steal information or use it for unauthorized purposes. So um, it's important 
for them, a feature that they need to implement in malware is very often um, uh, some sort of unique remote access protocols. Um, a common approach is to implement these over an existing standard like HTTP um, or HTTPS. Um, other times there's uh, kind of binary traffic protocols that are un entirely unique to the malware. So a popular one that had been used for quite some time is the ghost malware, uh, which uh, its source code's leaked on the internet as well, and you can uh, do research and analyze it. Um, <clears throat> there are a few ways that um, these are typically leveraged. So we'll, when we're doing analysis, we'll take advantage of this kind of feature requirement, if you will, um, by <clears throat> trying to monitor what's attempting to occur, monitor um, what's going on in the wire. So I will say that it is not uncommon. We won't do this in this class, but it is not uncommon. And um, for those of you who do have the interest, uh, um, there are definitely places and uh, me uh, mechanisms out there to do it, is you can actually infect the system or infect the VM and then have that, um, actually have that VM beacon back to, uh, you know, beacon back to the adversary. Uh, so basically have a live intrusion going on in a controlled environment and have it connected to the internet. So that's actually an approach called a, typically called a honeypot or honey net uh, that a lot of security research firms actually employ. And so that's kind of what we're talking about here, uh, monitoring, traffic capture, that type of stuff. Uh, the nice thing about that is that uh, if you do happen to successfully confuse the adversary that they're in a real system for some period of time, uh, <clears throat> you're likely to I, you're likely to be able to identify them trying to uh, perform actions against your system and basically gather more information about what tools they use, what places they go to look, that type of thing. And then uh, you can compare that to known threats that you might have uh, encountered over time. Uh, additionally, you can do, this would be more along the lines of what we do in this class, is you can simulate network services to explore malware functionality. So you can either um, at least have something that listens and pretends to be a web server, or pretends to be an FTP server, or pretends to be a mail server, um, to try and see what the malware initially tries to do against those services. Or you can run into situations where you actually write, um, based upon your research, you actually write a uh, analyzer that tries to pretend to be an adversary interacting with malware. So um, this should be network impact example. Um, <clears throat> so using the same example, and again this is the network impact example, um, using the same sequence of steps earlier basically um, from the beginning until step eight, step eight is the only one where the malware finally starts to try and connect out to the uh, command and control server. Uh, so in that case, you get to identify that there's kind of bidirect, bidirectional adversary controlled data movement. So again, um, if the, you know, if the communication link um, gets established, uh, or I should say, attempts to reach out, uh, very often you end up having a session that um, is adversary controlled. So that's where um, the amount of data coming down from the remote end ends up being relatively small, while the amount of data that happens to go out from the client back out to the network ends up being larger, which that tends to be a kind of orthogonal relationship to uh, normal program traffic, which is to reach out and um, pull new information down. Uh, also, and this is where it gets handy for detection. The malware protocol is often visible at this stage too. So if you did not, if you were not able to identify what type of backdoor it was through stages one through seven, uh, at stage eight, if you start actually capturing the network traffic and storing it kind of similar to what you did with the netcat um, or whatever mechanism you ended up using in that first, uh, uh, in that first lab, <coughs> um, if you end up doing um, basically that traffic inspection and saving the traffic, then you can um, compare the traffic to basically uh, other known malware samples traffic that you've collected over time. So, and then finally, um, we'll go into the system-wide resources and handles. 
Um, and I believe I talked a little bit to these earlier on uh, during the kind of initial layout of all the uh, things that existed. Um, but basically, the operating system in a nutshell X is what I call a resource manager. So if you took operating systems class, or if you will take operating systems class, kind of thinking about it in terms of a uh, <clears throat> as a manager of all the resources in your computer, that being your uh, system memory, your drives, your CPU, uh, your network access, all that stuff. Um, <clears throat> um, it also ends up maintaining all of these in-system data structures that help you uh, govern access to those things. Uh, so I list five of them up here, and this is an, an exhaustive list. Um, but there are great examples of um, uh, operating system level and user level objects that might be created uh, for malware to use. And I would consider all five of these to be almost like system-wide system, system -wide, uh, objects. Uh, so for instance, um, I give a great example up there of um, uh, mutexes and semaphores. Uh, so <clears throat> those of you who are familiar with uh, network programming or um, the Linux, uh, Linux programming classes, and uh, I'm trying to think, uh, use them in operating systems as well. So you would use semaphores for like the consumer producer problem uh, that you, everyone probably had to implement at least once. Um, basically, <coughs> Um, those things are very common uh, control mechanisms uh, for multiprocessing data. So um, Windows is interesting in that uh, it is one of the, it, it's a very old um, multi, um, I guess like multiprocessing environment or multitasking multi environment, that's a better way to put it, multitasking. It's a very old multitasking environment. And when they first uh, developed Windows, um, inter-process communication, which I believe we discussed like the DDE protocol and that stuff um, earlier on, uh, inter-process communication was a hugely popular feature that made it into a lot of Windows applications. Uh, so to uh, support that, uh, Microsoft created these operating system level primitives of mutexes and semaphores that could be created. Uh, so that, for instance, if Microsoft Word is trying to interact with some, um, you know, with some application that somebody decided to build to, um, you know, to run some accounting software, the two can safely exchange data and then trigger each other with an event that indicates like a handoff of uh, control over that data, over that shared data. Um, so these things exist as system level objects. Uh, the reason I bring them up is because they have a very specific, though they have a very specific software development uh, reason for existence, um, that they are system level objects makes them also useful for another application. And that is um, one of the problems that a lot of adversaries have is that um, if they're trying to attack the same group of users over and over again, so the same thousand targets or something like that, uh, <clears throat> Um, just think back to when you were trying to put together the um, homework one exploits and you were trying to pick something that would work. Um, some of you might have had to uh, try the same attack multiple times and it only worked sometimes or maybe it only worked on the first time but then if you tried it a second time it would fail so if like the connection was severed and then you tried a second time it would fail. Um, that, uh, I guess, um, uh, non-deterministic nature of like the system environment can basically create the problem of having a, um, you know, only partially successful attack. So even though the entire population might be vulnerable to an exploit, um, only like half of them may actually become successfully um, exploited by a particular attack. Um, also, you may run into a situation where all of your targets are running different environments. So you might need to hit them with, say, five or six different attacks if you want to maximize your kind of attack coverage. Um, again, speaking from the adversary perspective. Uh, so <clears throat> just kind of looking back up at this, so the sequence of steps, think about this as me making new PDFs each time I want to attack. At the end of the day, steps two through eight are still the same, which is the user 
ends up trying to open the PDF no matter what version of the attack it is and then eventually the goal is to get to step 8 where bad.exe is running on a system. So uh, one of the problems for a lot of adversaries is what happens if I end up delivering the same attack or I should say a new version of the attack maybe three new versions of the attack to the same person. Do I end up compromising them four times? Or basically have my back door running on them four times? Or um, is that, does that end up putting me in a bad position by basically making it um, uh, more obvious that I'm present on their system? Uh, because that would result in a setup where you end up having four of the same kind of rogue program running on a computer, uh, the user might experience like uh, negative impacts, performance impacts, stuff like that. Or you might just be more obvious. So you might be trying to maximize your, say, attack coverage while also causing some of your successful attacks to now drop off of the list of who's compromised. So in order to um, get around this problem, what a lot of adversaries have done is they've taken to using these data structures that Windows offers. So there's actually a uh, create mutex uh, system call in Windows, or API call in Windows, uh, that allows you to create a mutex with a global name. So I can create a mutex that's like so that's called Coleman or something like that. And that means that no other computer in the entire, or no other application in the entire computer is allowed to make another mutex called Coleman um, <clears throat> until I destroy it. Uh, so uh, in practicality, how that ends up operating is a lot of times actors will write malware that ends up employing the creation of one of these system level uh, features um, and then they'll basically identify that a version of that attack is already running on that system and then they'll have the new one just quit and exit uh, very quickly. Uh, so that way you only have one version of the attack working. You don't end up flooding your attacker console and all that stuff. Uh, likewise, um, whenever you are um, opening up a new network listener or when you're connecting, um, a new session back. Uh, it's very, um, that itself is a very kind of operating <coughs> system wide action. So if uh, any of you are familiar with doing system administration and stuff like that, um, you'll know that if I open up a listener to listen for all incoming traffic on port 443 or something like that, then I can't then run another program that also does that. Basically, I've locked myself out of, or I've reserved that for the one application I did it. So the same is true with uh, you know, malware. If uh, malware ends up opening up a listen socket, uh, or even creating a new one, um, it ends up leaving a, per, uh, a row or a entity in the data structure that manages all network sockets for the system. Uh, same with lock files. So uh, similar to mutexes and semaphores, uh, lock files might be used. Uh, to try and um, uh, you know control access to certain resources, and then finally, um, system pipes is a way for many of you probably use them in in Linux all the time at the command line. Um, in Windows, the same kind of facility exists. Um, it's a little bit in I would say at the program level, it's a bit more uh, complicated to construct. Um, but a lot of malware that ends up coming in multiple components um, where they need to maybe cooperate. For instance, uh, you might have one component that monitors web browser traffic looking for banking credential logins and things like that, uh, while a separate component's actually what's responsible for sending all collected information back to the command and control. Uh, those two things need to communicate and one other mechanism in addition to like shared memory and things like that. One other mechanism that's popular to communicate is using system bytes in Windows. And again, uh, some of those might be created with a very specific name that can tie back to um, the malware. And the reason I kind of bring all these up is that this one ends up having a very unique, or may end up having a very distinctive name because the two, uh, the two programs need to be able to be hard coded to have the same name, uh, same name pipe so they know what pipe to open. Uh, these two things, mutexes and semaphores, 
Uh, if you're using them for, say, uh, identifying uh, or preventing you from being able to, say, multiple compromise a user, uh, you'll want to have a very distinctive value that doesn't happen to be one that's reused in any normal code. Uh, because then if you end up reusing a mutex or semaphore name that's in normal code, uh, or I should say in normal applications, then you run the risk of not being able to run your back door on computers that are running those normal applications. So it ends up having to be something that's distinct, so no other adversaries are using it, except for you, and also no other programmers are using it. Uh, so it ends up being a unique value. And uh, all three of these are things that if I am a operating system administrator, if I'm a Windows admin, I can actually query the system to give me a dump of all these things and have it tell me if any of them are on there by name. So it gives me an in inspection point to look through. Uh, ditto for network sockets, I can always run netstat on a computer to see what uh, network connections it has open. And then uh, finally, lock files. Again, it's another great example of a um, of a you know of a component where the if it's using lock files to try and um, you know control uh, or manage access um, you know between writing a file and then having some other component read it or some other thread read it, then that file needs to have a unique enough name to it so that the adversary can guarantee that there won't be some kind of third party application that tramples on it either. So again, it ends up being some identifying uh, uh, characteristics that are left behind. So I'll go ahead and jump out of the presentation now. And um, I believe I have a uh, yeah Windows uh, 7 VM running. So I'm gonna do this really quick. Uh, So uh, what I did um, was I actually pulled down a large number of tools that are useful for dynamic analysis, and I believe I'll have those in, or in a later presentation. Um, but I basically just organized them all in a folder. So they'll actually be um, the folder structure that I'll be showing you up here is going to be uh, roughly the same as the uh, folder structure that you'll get when I distribute the oops when I distribute the bundle to you as well so uh, what I have is a really large set of tools in here um, and then I'm going to do one more thing which is and this is the part that I need to let me just double check and see I don't think I have malware in this, so let me see. So a number of PDFs. Let me grab this one, I think. I'm going to go and attach this one. So let me go back out here. So I have that application. And then I have this PDF. Oh, but I don't have PDF right here. 
I can probably just do this though. I think I have this one, and I think this is a this one might be a good one to just use. This is actually a program, so um, I'm not even going to deal with the PDF case this time. We'll do this another day because um, I think there's going to be one lecture where I end up opening the end up doing the PDF. Um, uh, Acrobat reader in a debugger to identify the PDF exploit type of thing. So we'll save the PDF for that day. Um, so this um, is actually an EXE. Um, so uh, this is actually, I think, a malware sample that's not uh, too old. Was a, if I remember correctly, uh, was like a, it's called Emotat or something. So very common one. I'll just look it up really quickly to to show you all. Um, unless uh, unless Wi-Fi is not working today. Hmm. Well, it's very possible that uh, let me see. Yeah. Oh well. I don't know what happened with the uh, internet. That happens from time to time, though. Uh, there go. Sorry about that. Um, I don't necessarily need Wi-Fi if I'm going uh, for this, but uh, let's see if uh, let's see if that fixed it. That fixed it. So there we go. Turn it off. Turn it back on again. So here we go. Um, so emo tat. Um, if uh, you want to read about it, that's fine. Uh, so I figured I'd just. Show you a sample of it. I think that's what this is. Um, so I can't always be 100% certain because um, I look at a lot of stuff. Uh, but anyway, uh, so first steps first. Uh, what I want to do is uh, let me bring this one back to the front. Um, what I want to do is I'm actually going to save the state here um, because. <clears throat> What we're, we'll end up doing is we'll end up running this. Um, we'll end up running this sample uh, multiple times uh, and seeing what these different uh, tools and seeing what these uh, different analysis tools will uh, do for us. And also, it's just a lot easier to. Uh, to restart if I already have the machine booted up. So uh, first things first, let me make sure. This is something you should all be doing um, if you are evaluating or if you are testing an attack. Um, I'm just going to, I said this before I started, but I figured I would double check to make sure that host only adapter was set. So I don't want this thing to accidentally start causing my computer to start trying to beacon to a known bad IP address or a known bad domain name. Uh, while I'm connected to the uh, to the UC network, so this way I've now established that it's all um, nice and closed off. Uh, the other thing that I'll just uh, um, that I'll take a look at really quickly is I'm going to go in here and go to status, and then go to details, and I just basically wanted to make sure that I have that. Uh, the reason I'm doing that. Is that oh, is that so I can't ping, but we all remember why that is. I need to do the firewall thing, so Oh, 
I probably just do this. Um, sharing Center, Windows Firewall, turn Windows Firewall on or off, turn it off, turn it off, OK. And then I think uh, Defender, is that a Windows Defender? Let us. not use Windows Defender. There we go. Turn Windows Defender off. So I got those two things just because I don't want anything to interfere. And now um, probably let me do this really quick. So this is the nice thing about VirtualBox is that I will delete the snapshot so I've not compromised yet, so I'm going to delete that snapshot. I'm going to take it again so I don't have to redo the security settings. So there we go. So now uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go into the dynamic tools. And um, the first one that I'm going to go and uh, bring up for you all is uh, we'll go into the sys internals tools. So um, those are real common rudimentary ones. Where is this one? This is the one I want. Did you verify that Pelican theme? What's that? Did you verify that Pelican theme? Oh. Oh, if uh, I can. Uh, there it goes. Yeah. Thanks. So just validating that after I turned off the inner, the firewall settings and all that, now I can ping. So, um, so let's go back up. Oh, here we go. This. So Windows Sys internals um, <coughs> is actually a really useful set of tools. So you can see they have all the stuff here. So what we'll do is we'll go to downloads because I think, um, yeah. So this right here. Um, top link is the download for the whole suite. So Microsoft actually made makes a large number of tools available that are useful for doing kind of system inspection. And system inspection ends up being a important, you know, important piece to the analysis process, right? Um, and as you can see, they keep a lot of them up to date. So this particular one. Uh, viewing effective permission on files, registry keys, services, processes, kernel objects, and more. So this is kind of like a nice inventorying tool uh, for uh, access control lists and permissions and stuff like that. Um, it allows you to get actually um, system-wide visibility without having to manually open the dialog for each one of them. Um, and it was just updated last year. Uh, there's another one that was updated uh, last month, the uh, auto runs. So see what programs are configured to start up automatically when your system boots and you log in. So auto runs shows you the full list of registry and file locations. So this is useful, I'll tell you, for identifying a lot of the persistence mechanisms that we talked about. Uh, so in addition to the, um, to the startup menu, you can put a program in the startup menu, and, or yeah, in the startup folder, and then that'll be detected by this. You can also hijack a Windows um, service and then install your EXE to basically have the service running. Uh, that, this will also inventory all those things. There's also a number of other more obscure places where um, auto run a program on boot up or auto run a program on login is defined in Windows. And this actually inventories all of them and then the, you know, the program is of course kept up to date to try and track all that stuff. Um, <clears throat> so this one's useful, um, you know, background. This might be more useful just if you're running a lot of VMs, a way to kind of keep all the VMs uh, um, set up, you know. So anyway, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to run the program, and then I use a handful of these to go and inspect what's going on. Um, specifically, I'm going to probably end up using um, Process Explorer. Uh, and then maybe later I'll end up using Process Monitor 
um, to try and analyze the um, the file system changes, registry changes, process thread, and deal all activity. Um, but we'll start with Process Explorer. Um, so I'm going to sys internal suite and then so proc exp. And then there's um, another thing that's helpful here is that there's 64-bit versions and 32-bit versions of each. So I'm using a 32-bit version of Windows. So um, I'm going to use the 32-bit executable. So uh, whoops, sorry about that. So that ends up being the zipped folder. I actually want to use. I extracted all these ahead of time, so I actually want to use that. So there's Process Explorer right there. <coughs> now it may take a little bit uh, to get in or to get started. The other thing I'll say is that some of these programs, uh, because they came from Microsoft, uh, a lot of times they have this because everything that comes from Microsoft has a big click-through license like this that forces you. Um, there is a way, you know, read through it, agree to it, etc. cetera. Um, there is a way to actually accept on the command line as well. So if you look up the documentation, you can figure out how to do that. Uh, so uh, Process Explorer, as you can see now, ends up being a tool that's very similar to the task manager that you're probably familiar with. Um, you can actually replace the task manager with Process Explorer somehow on a lot of systems. And that's a common approach that I've seen a lot of people do. Um, so that if you bring up Task Manager, instead it just brings this up, which is a lot, you know, gives you a lot more visibility. So for instance, I can go in here, um, I can look at properties. Let me see if I can, okay. There we go. So we'll do that. Um, I have resolution uh, hurdles here, but uh, <clears throat> so one of the neat things is that I can um, uh, I can actually so it has a lot of really cool um, features. So for instance, I can have it it tells me what uh, exe full path of the exe um, that's running that pro that process is responsible for. Uh, I can actually have it open up the Explorer window. It gives me the command line. So for instance, if this was run with a bunch of arguments, it'll provide the arguments. It shows me the current working directory. So if it has a, um, uh, if it was set up to run from a particular directory, if it's tied to expecting a certain directory to be the current working directory, that'll be listed here. Um, also, if it was identified, or I should say, if it was run as a program, to be run on startup, it'll also be highlighted here, which helps you out with some of that kind of persistence. So as you can see, uh, you can already start getting an idea of how this particular tool would allow you to walk through each one of the programs running on your system and see if they match anything that at least you know off the top of your head. Um, it has some performance metrics as well, which is super helpful. Um, it has a more structured view of that kind of auto run thing. Um, I don't have the correct version of this to uh, read all the threads and get all the thread information, but this allows you to identify since a program has or can have many different threads running, and that's a lot of times what a lot of the lock files and mutexes and semaphores can be used to try and negotiate data movement between. Uh, this actually allows you to inspect, uh, basically get a list and inspect them all. Um, you can see if it's performing any, if it's got any of those network sockets open. So as I was talking about uh, system-wide data structures uh, the, that these things end up uh, locking or using, this is one of them. And so you'd be able to actually see uh, the network communication and network sockets that this particular application is responsible for. Uh, similarly, um, there's uh, you know all, all of these things as well. I think. Let me see. I think I can do, oops, I'm trying to right click on it, sorry. Yeah. So sometimes you may run into a situation where there's a little bit of a delay um, trying to run stuff from the network share. Um, Okay, 
There we go. So I can try running as administrator, and I might be able to get um, more visibility into some of the things. So like, yeah. So see, if I run it as administrator, I can actually get visibility into what all the permissions are that are attached to that particular, and the policies that are attached or have been requested for that particular uh, program. And similarly, I can see all the environment variables, and then I can also do some very simple strings analysis of both the program on disk, but also whatever happens to be in memory. So, uh, so that gives me that stuff. Uh, so let's see what happens if I if I run the malware. You can see it's running right here. And then it disappeared. And so and so there happens to be this other weird program that just randomly showed up called generalized character. And I have no idea what that is. But it wasn't running before. So um uh, and as you can see, the program disappeared. The one that I originally copied to the desktop, desktop disappeared. Uh, and it ended up going somewhere. So let's go in here. Um, you know, so this is a good example right here of um, uh, this tool that we're looking at has its limitations as well. So this tool tells us what the system looks like right now. It gives you kind of that snapshot window in time um, point of view on the system, which can be really useful. Um, especially if I know a lot about my computers. Um, but if I happen to come in here and say, um, instead of being called generalized character.exe, that was just like msword.exe or something like that, um, it might not stick out to me. Um, but since I know what it is, what I'll do is I'll double click on it. And I can go and I can look at the different threads um, so I can see, you know, <clears throat> Number one, I will tell you that there's no kind of secret sauce here. Um, I can't really uh, go in and tell you what each one of these individual things um, are responsible for, so I'm not going to try. Um, we'll go back to the image, and you'll notice that <clears throat> the image actually puts this right here. So I can actually go and open it, and it shows me that um, that folder um, at least I'm interpreting just from what I'm seeing here that folder looks like it was created for this program. Um, so this program ends up having some various types of information. Um, <clears throat> you know, this is basically just giving me the metadata um, modified. May 3rd, so you can see that um, the modification date was retained when I copied it from wherever I copied it from. So it's not hugely significant there. It tells me the command lines here. So in addition to running this program, uh, so if you remember, I ran it initially when it was called gy.exe and it was on my desktop. gy.exe wrote this other program that just happens to have the same icon. If you remember, the two icons were this weird uh, almost looks like somebody decided to just like use MS Paint and then draw a bunch of lines and then save that as an image and then make that be the icon in uh, their project. Um, so whatever it did is it created this folder probably because I haven't looked at that aspect of it yet and then it put this program in there. And then when it ran that program it also gave it this long string on the command line. So it gave it this command line argument for some reason. I don't know why, but uh, if I were to go and start investigating that program, I would want to use that information. Because if I try and run the program and I can't get it to do anything, I may want to try running it and giving it this command line argument and see if that gets it to do anything. And then if that works, I may want to try giving it this command line argument with slightly different numbers and see if that changes the behavior or anything like that. So it gives me some insight that the program is reading the command line arguments is looking for one to be dash u followed by a bunch of numbers 
and then wants to do something with that argument, um, maybe. Um, <clears throat> this also tells me that when the program ran, the program set the working directory to be the user's desktop. So even though the program was executed from this folder, the program is still running with this desktop so uh, folder as the um, you know as the program's kind of working directory. Uh, so this indicates to me that when um, gy.exe was run, that was run from the desktop, and then I didn't do anything else after I double clicked on it. But that program eventually caused this one to start running. This program probably just inherited the same working directory from the original um, application that I double clicked on. So at least that's my um, uh, that's my kind of suspicion. Um, I can also do this if I wanted to. It's not going to work because I don't have this thing connected to the internet. Um, but this is very useful. We looked through some virus total analysis reports at one of the when we were talking about the kind of open source resources that are online. Um, what this will do <clears throat> is it will actually hash the file. So using those checksums that we talked about, the MD5, SHA1, SHA256, etc. Um, <clears throat> it'll actually look those up on virus total to see if a copy of them's on there. And then if you want to, you can actually um, submit a file's contents to virus total if you really want to. Um, so again, this would be in an environment where the internet access happens to be available to the system that's compromised. So I'm going to click no, but that can be very useful on just trying to point you at open source resources without having to manually do a lot of the um, check some lookups that we were doing uh, in class um, that day. It gives you the ability to very quickly kill the process. Uh, bring to front um, would be if that program happened to have a window open. Not all programs are required to have windows in Windows. Um, the, a lot of times if they don't have a um, if they don't have a window associated with them what they end up creating is a hidden window uh, or an invisible window that runs in the background and is basically unable to be shown. Uh, so that's what this thing is uh, is showing you. But um, you know, I will say that a lot of times you could run this like bring to front if you have some sort of um, question as to whether maybe a tool that you find running in this process explorer tool happens to be like an engineering application or something like that. That's a good way to try and um, you know n nail that down. Um, so. <clears throat> Doesn't look like it's got any uh, network uh, connections open right now, but that may very well be just because I don't have uh, network access configured here. Um, I already showed you the threads. Um, here's the um, permissions, uh, basically. And I think these end up being um, pretty consistent with any other normal uh, running program. So. You can see the environment, how it's set up, all that stuff. Um, and then you can go and uh, investigate the different strings. So this is where um, you can basically get a strings list. So this allows you to like copy all these and then you can paste them into your analysis systems. Likewise, memory is here as well. So this can be very useful uh, if, for instance, uh, you have a program that happens to be like encoded or something like that. Um, on disk, it might not be easy for you to identify the different uh, strings that might be indicative of what type of malware it is. In that case, you might end up using the memory view instead, which is actually dumping contents of memory. So um, you can also do searching in there as well. So if you know, so say for instance, um, <clears throat> I have a network of 20 computers. I found malware on one of them, and I found a very unique string in the malware on one of them. Uh, you'll notice that on this particular one, it gave itself this this weird name, generalized character. Um, <clears throat> I'll just give you a spoiler alert on this one, is it randomly generates from a dictionary two words and just joins them together. So if you end up finding 
this program on other computers, it might be two completely different words that are stitched together. It may not be readily apparent uh, that this one or that on the other computer it's the same uh, p it's the same tool. So that's where being able to do this kind of live inspection of memory and being able to search for significant strings might uh, might help you out. So I'm going to go ahead and close that. Uh, finally, the other thing too is a really good analysis task uh, that's facilitated by this. Come on, facilitated by this tool. Okay, let me just do this. Is I can suspend the process if I want, so I can cause it to freeze, um, and then I can also um, dump memory. So I can either dump memory of just the contents of that program. So um, in Windows, and we kind of talked about this before, if you remember, when we were using OBJ dump to inspect the um, metadata inside of an EXE, we were able to identify that it would use a number of DLLs and it would import a bunch of functions for those. So those actually all get mapped into memory. And so then you have memory available to your program is comprised of your program and then all of the data that it allocates memory for. And then also separate libraries that actually get dedicated their own memory space. This allows you to either create a dump, like a memory dump, of just your program plus all of the dynamically allocated or runtime allocated memory it's responsible for, or you can actually get a dump of the program, basically all of that, plus the same thing for all the DLLs that your program's using as well. Uh, so for instance, if you feel that your program might be taking advantage or might be uh, injecting some of its code into some other DLLs, uh, then this would be a good way to kind of get eyes on that so you can analyze it. So these things end up being very, pop very common from the forensic side, um, but then on the malware analysis side, you'll find that you may be using these to try and run some signatures uh, like the Yara signature that you are generating for homework two uh, <coughs> against both the program on disk and also the program in memory in case they're trying to hide it in memory. Now, I think there is a good uh, virus check, virus double check in the stack part of the analysis. Um, you don't want to do that for uh, right. I was running. Yep. In the static part of the analysis. <coughs> but, you know, yeah. Don't you do that. So the question was, is it better to do the virus total check during the static part of the analysis? I'd say yes, um, all the time. Um, uh, one key thing to keep in mind for this tool is that um, this tool exists not just for you to use in the malware analysis side. It also exists for people to use in the field um, when they're responsible for defending a network. And so when you have a user that complains about their machine slow um, and they don't know why, uh, rather than erasing the machine and that because that might be very disruptive to the user uh, you might actually have like a USB stick or something like that with all these tools on it and you take the tool to the machine you run it on there uh, and then you end up finding these programs running here on a machine that's already connected to the internet so a machine connected to the internet might already be compromised but you're trying to validate that so you might walk through all of the processes uh, that are unknown. A common strategy would be um, <clears throat> find another user that sit next, sits in the same office that's not complaining about their computer, run the program on both of them, and then compare the task lists and then look up the virus total hash uh, for any of the programs that don't show up in the good computer, right? So that's kind of some that's kind of some of the reason why the functionality is built in here. Um, but you know, as I said. Uh, generally, it's always preferable to keep this thing disconnected from the internet as much as you can, uh, just because it can, you know, it can min uh, minimize impact. So, What's the difference between this tool and Procmon? <clears throat> so, Procmon was another one that I was going to show you, um, but in order to show you, I want to do this. So I'm going to restore, basically going back to not being compromised. Um, so we'll revert. I just reverted the image. And uh, 
And so another tool, and I'm actually just going to put this right here, is Procmon. Yeah, here we go. So here's the process monitor. So as you can see, it's basically keeping a log of all the activity that's going on on the system. So what I might choose to do uh, let me see if I can remember. Yeah. So I turned off the auto scroll. So I'll go back up here to the top. Um, it's for the most part monitoring system activities. I don't know. I think I'll do this. There we go. So I can see. Here, we'll do, this will be a lot easier. I can see the earliest thing that happened all the way down to the most recent thing that happened, right? Um, and I can clear it. Um, so basically, this is monitoring all of the system events that are going on on the system or on the computer. So what I might try and do is try and see if I clear it. Um, just do this. Wait, yeah, like that. And so then I'll run this program and try and see uh, if it can find any. Uh, remember, it executes a number of steps, right? So now I'll try and see if any of that stuff shows up in Procmon. Um, one thing I will say is that. Here we go. So I might end up, yeah, here you go. Okay, right there. There we go. So there is, come on. <laughs> so there's gy.exe. Uh, that's basically, I think, that's around the time that I first uh, clicked on it. Uh, let me see if I can, you'll have to bear with me for a moment because I cannot entirely remember if there's a way for me to, yeah, here we go. So I can actually turn off the capture feature. I basically have it, come on, there we go. So I think now it's not capturing anymore. So now I can more easily kind of navigate things. So this is like me from a malware analyst perspective trying to figure out uh, what's happening. So if you remember, I can still run um, Process Explorer to try and tell me what that malware sample is right now, right? So we'll do that because uh, there should be a program with some weird name running that tells me what that, uh, uh, yeah, so here it is, generalized character. So uh, if I remember, that was actually the same name that it used before, which means the random number generator it uses is not uh, super random. It bases it on a handful of things. So I can actually, I think I can do this. Right, so I can find out you know, the first occurrence where a generalized character happened, right, <coughs> is right here. And you'll notice that the program that did the work is still that gy.exe. So my suspicion of uh, what it was doing uh, uh, was, you know, was right on. It was basically, uh, let me see if I can remember how, properties, here we go. So I can actually look at the event which is right here. Where basically, it's loading an image uh, from here. Uh, in Windows, load image basically means load a Windows compatible program into memory and set up memory for it. So it's not just open a file and read it into memory. It's open a file, parse the exe header, and then set up memory space accordingly for that so that if I want to run code from it, it can successfully run. 
Uh, so it gives all that information. So what we're looking at right now is actually an event uh, that occurred to call that function. One of the neat things here as well is that um, uh, <clears throat> is that that function call, uh, the stack trace from that function call is actually listed here as well. So. So that's all there. Um, you can also see that the program did a large number of uh, other things as well. So there was a whole bunch of like querying the registry values and things like that. Um, and then you can see that. Close the key. So what I might end up doing is I might end up filtering to say, and so there's a whole bunch of exclusions in here, right? So I can actually filter this entire list um, based upon this stuff. So I can say um, process name is, we'll say gy.exe, then include. Or I can say is not that, then exclude, right? And then this will go through the entire list. So it kind of works at like a very simple version of a uh, uh, Windows spreadsheet or something like that. And so now I've limited all the data in here to just be stuff related to that one program. So I can see the process start. And then all the way down here to process exit. And then a handful of uh, registry key closing operations that occur as a consequence of program wanted to exit but it still had a number of things open just like you can um, exit a program leaving a file open it'll automatically get closed uh, the same is true with the Windows registry so you can see the process ended there uh, so maybe I can go in here and I can uh, change that filter to basically say let me see yeah, basically say uh, and so what's neat too is it gives you a nice interface for being able to bounce back and forth between those pivots um, so now I can see the program generalized character started and if I go all the way down here um, it's still running, so it like created another thread. It did all these things, so um, you know it tried to load this library. So this would indicate to me that the program is trying to talk over the network, um, that type of stuff. Uh, so the other thing I can do is I can save this, so I can actually save all of the data here into a CSV, which can be very useful for parsing with Python um, or parsing with um, uh, Microsoft Excel or a similar spreadsheet tool if you wanted to use that. Um, I can actually choose to export all the events or just the events that I filtered down to. So if I build a nice complex filter, I can end up doing that. Um, highlighted events, so if I shift, uh, if I did this, I can actually have it export just a handful of events that are in there. Um, but the nice thing is that uh, right now, the, in its current form, this is useful for me to hand navigate, right? Not very useful for me to programmatically navigate. So uh, it actually has a mechanism that allows me to get that stuff out in a fashion that then I can uh, programmatically navigate it uh, so that um, uh, basically so that I can analyze it a lot further. For instance, if I have a database of um, you know, <clears throat> if I have a database of a large number of known uh, file names and known program names and known registry names, uh, that is thousands and thousands and thousands of uh, data points, uh, I can't hand search for those here. This gives me the ability to do that. Uh, likewise, if I collect seven files from a bunch of different computers on my system that look like they were all compromises, um, 
I can export seven different CSVs and then I can actually run some sort of a similarity algorithm or something like that against them to maybe build up a profile or something and see if maybe all of those tools are the same tool. So it gives me a lot of avenues to be able to do that. Um, so yeah, but this is again, this is the process monitor, uh, try and see, um, I can't remember all of the possible, I was gonna try and see if there was any of the network traffic attempts listed in here or not, but I'm not entirely certain if this thing actually documents those. It may not, um, considering that I don't have network access for this particular VM. Uh, so um, another tool, well, we got five minutes left, so um, I'll just go down here and I will show you, because this one is useful in that, um, so Sysmon is a newer tool, um, <coughs> so the, written by this guy, and um, <clears throat> Sysmon's nice, I'll just go down here, in that um, it'll actually, um, a lot of you are familiar, or may be familiar with uh, Windows event logging, so if I, if I do this, event viewer, right? So if I go to event viewer on Windows, um, a great example of this is if I'm on a computer that's running antivirus, so if I'm running McAfee or Windows Defender or something like that, so if I'm getting back to the example where uh, we're responding to a user who is complaining about their system acting weird and they think it's compromised. Um, <clears throat> if they're running an antivirus tool and the antivirus tool did do some either detections um, or at least identified some suspicious activity, a lot of times that would end up here in the uh, event logs. And this is where, uh, say, Windows and a lot of the different applications that you may have in window, installed in Windows. Um, I'm trying to see if there's actually any logs. Oh, here it goes. So this can take a little while to load up, but let's go here. So you can see there's a whole bunch of things in here. So I don't know, maybe like this one. Uh, so you can see there's a bunch of basically little events that happen in Windows. This thing's huge, there's a lot of events in here. Um, so there's also a lot of events that happen in Windows that you would like to have eyes on. Um, for instance, some of the events that occurred that we were able to see with Procmon, those events, like the registry changes and stuff like that, aren't normally available to in the Windows event log. Um, so if you are uh, analyzing Windows event logs uh, for activity, uh, you end up having to run a separate tool like Procmon uh, in order to get the data out, and it ends up coming out in a different uh, format. So this tool will actually allow you to selectively choose a number of different events um, to actually inspect uh, and generate data to the Windows event log uh, to try and identify what's going on. So for instance, um, <clears throat> uh, you might report the hashes of all of the load images. So if you remember, there was that load image call that was made by GUI in order to load up the generalized character.exe. Uh, when that happens, this thing can take a hash of that process and then report that to the Windows event log. Um, you can have it log all network connections. So if a computer tries to connect to another computer, that can be logged. Um, you can log the loading of modules, so additional modules that end up getting uh, loaded. Um, also can be logged. Um, you can log some of the um, program signature checks as well, the signature certificates. And there's a lot more fine grain stuff you can do with this too. So it gives some examples here where it's co commonly used. And then it gives a bunch of different event types that it actually allows you. So a great example would be process change date file creation time. So typically the only thing that should set, ideally the creation time, is Windows itself when a file is created. Um, if a program that's not Windows 
ends up changing a file creation time, um, that's something that could indicate that somebody's trying to cover up their tracks or something like that. Um, so network connections, um, process termination, so when a process uh, exits, <clears throat> when a driver is loaded or unloaded, so something again that shouldn't happen except for when you are administering a Windows system. Uh, image loaded, uh, module is loaded in a specific process, uh, create remote thread. So I think we talked about that um, last class a little bit, which was that there's a facility where I can create code and then I can tell in memory and then I can go and tell another program to run my code in its own process space. So I can basically create a thread and I can attach it to a process that's not me. Uh, cool feature, um, also cool vulnerability. Um, it ha since that is a very non-standard or atypical uh, use case, that's something that can be logged by this. So the idea here is that Sysmon exists so that you can identify a lot of these cases or these events happening and you can log them and then you can review all those logs at some point in the future when something else triggers you, for instance, a user complaint or something like that to help you stitch the picture back together as to what happened. 